My wife is a doctor, okay, which means she's accomplished more in her short life than Hillary Clinton has in her entire life. My wife is a doctor who takes care of people. She never at any point in her life sat around thinking, you know what, I can't be a doctor until Hillary Clinton, a corrupt old shrew, becomes a presidential nominee. My mom, when I was growing up, my mom worked and my dad was a stay-at-home dad. And my mom didn't sit around wondering, can I run film and television companies? I don't know. I'll have to think about whether Hillary Clinton could become president. This is all so stupid. Women, by the way, are a majority of bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and associate's degrees. Next year, according to the American Bar Association, there will be a majority of law students in the United States. American women don't need Hillary Clinton to shatter a glass ceiling that doesn't exist. So wouldn't you concede that it's possibly, possibly better to redistribute wealth then so that others are able to rise up, join the middle class, procure a better education so that they're a better workforce okay, efficiently on a global redistribution scale. Redistribution of wealth does not achieve competition. Because it turns out that what actually achieves competition is the sort of values that you impose in your work life. This is why if you have a bunch of people who win the lottery, disproportionately people who are poor and win the lottery end up poor again. The reason people are permanently poor in the United States is not because they don't have money, it's because they suck with money. The reason people are temporarily poor is because they don't have money. The reason they're permanently poor Okay, this is self-evident, folks. That's not even controversial. If you're, poor, if you're poor in America your entire life, you are not great with money, by definition. Okay, if you are... Name me one person in America who's phenomenal with money, but is poor for 80 years in the United States. Anybody? Names? Anyone? Okay, military veterans. Okay, military... Okay, military, okay. Test, test. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Yeah, Spiro. I'm, I, I'm, I'm uh, at a point right now, quite frankly, where um, I'm going to dismiss the students um, I know there are other questions that would like to be asked. Um, it's why, with all due respect, Mr. Shapiro, um, the, Mr. Shapiro represents a narrative that he's providing to all of you guys based off of his opinions, what he believes, and and um, what he wants to share with all of you. I know that the education was there for all of you to understand the left side, right side. What not, but also the opportunity was allowed for him to impress upon you some of his opinions about certain things. And I, and I think the lesson was there for me to understand and also for all of you to understand. I think what this is getting into now is it, it's starting to cross the line. And what would that line be? Why, why, is, why are they crossing the line? I don't see nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. Let me ask this You're question. the one who's crossing the line. Let me ask this If for those students who would like to be dismissed, um, I'm allowing you to go ahead and do so at this time. For those of you who would like to continue to listen, you can remain and listen to Mr. and also the uh, is how do we reach the low information populace when we can't get around the, the media and we can't get the information out and for those of us who have friends who are low information voting Democrats who think they're Democrats because they don't understand what it means now what in a sentence or two this is the right question say to this is totally the right question Right, the right question is not what do we do about Obama, particularly the question is not what do we do about the criminality of this particular administration. The question is how do we reach people? How do we talk to them on a level that they understand? And believe it or not, me citing the Arms Export Control Act is not gonna do a lot of good with people my age who don't know what, that, that arms are not those things that Jillian Barbary has on her, on her body. The, 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 the answer is actually, uh, d nobody has spelled this out better than, than my, my mentor, David Horowitz. Nobody has spelled this out better. You have to speak the language of morality. You must speak the language of morality. The left wins because nobody on the left knows anything about politics. They know you're evil. That's it. They know you're a racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe who hates the poor. 
right? That's what they know about you. And it's not they think that about you. They know that about you. Deep down, they know all these evil things about you, which is why Thanksgiving dinners are always so awkward if you're unfortunate to have Jewish relatives or, or you have friends on the left, which are the, the, the exact same focus group. The, the, the answer to all of this is to speak in the language of morality. This is why I never say the government compels people to do stuff. The government does not compel people to do stuff. The government compels people to do stuff at point of gun. Why do I say that? Because leftists are scared of guns. Right? When we say the government compels things, People say, oh, well, compulsion. Well, that's just like taxes, right? No. That's somebody coming to your house in the middle of the night with a SWAT team, with a gun, pointing it at you and dragging you off to prison for not doing what they want. Right? That is what we are facing. Right? When it comes to the left, it's not when we, we're such idiots, honestly. We were constantly arguing about whether our tax program is more efficient than their tax program. It's not about efficiency. Barack Obama gave the right answer to the wrong question, right? He gave, when he was asked in 2008, do you, would you raise the capital gains tax, even if it means less revenue to the government? Would you raise it? He said, yes, for purposes of fairness. Right? Even if it meant people were more impoverished, even if it meant people were more poor, the answer was yes, for purposes of fairness. Why? Because people don't speak the language of poverty. People don't speak the language of efficiency. People, speak, the people don't speak Mitt Romney's 57-point tax plan. You can't even name two points on his 57-point tax plan. People speak the language of fairness and justice and morality. They want to think that they are right and the other guy is wrong. They want to have an, a feeling of, in many cases, unearned moral superiority based on their opposition to things. This is why all of the, uh, everybody was getting off, ripping on Donald Sterling for being a crazy old racist coot. Did they accomplish anything? No. But they felt real good because they got to go around telling all their friends that Donald Sterling was a racist old coot. Right? This, this is what they do. So, speak their language. In other words, next time they say something like, I believe in the minimum wage, then you should say, why exactly is it that you want to put a gun to the head of a business owner and force them to pay something? Why is that okay? Why isn't that violative of basic principles of consent? Like you, you know, you over here, you like gay marriage because you say that two men should be able to wed each other, but those two men shouldn't be able to do business with each other in a mutually agreed relationship. So if instead of them having sex, they were actually just one was signing a check to the other to paint his car, then you're saying that's not okay? And that you're going to take a gun and put it to the head of one of them in order to make that happen? It's because you're a totalitarian. Right? This is the truth. The left is totalitarian. You don't have to feel bad about saying these things. And when, when somebody on the, when you talk about the inefficiencies of the left's social policies in the inner city, who gives a crap? This is really, I mean, honestly, that no one in the inner city is thinking about, wow, you know, this really is not very efficient. What they're thinking is there are a bunch of Tea Party Ku Klux Klaners out there who are going to invade their inner city and burn down their houses. Why do they think that? Because they're Democrats and apparently some Republicans, Thad Cochran, who actually have been doing this sort of stuff, have been saying this sort of stuff. The answer to that is that the real racists are and always have been folks on the left who wish to exploit racial division in order to pay off their cronies. The reason the education system sucks in the inner city is because the left wants to pay off its union buddies at the expense of black kids. The reason that the left has not done anything for the inner cities despite years of dominance in Detroit the reason is because they wanted the violence, and it is about intent. It's not about effect. And there's a really telling point in the 2012 election cycle when Bill Clinton was talking about Obama, and he said, you know, the difference, you know, the difference between uh, Obama and, and Mitt Romney is that Romney is somebody who, who says that Barack Obama's done a really poor job. Barack knows he hasn't done a great job, but he feels really bad about it. <laughs> this was an actual line. Right? And, and, and people bought that because, and, and the polls show this, right? 80% of people, 80% of people thought that Mitt Romney cared less about them than Barack Obama in exit polls. 80%. That's a majority of Republicans. Right? But when it came to policies, they agreed with Mitt Romney. But people don't vote with their heads, people vote with their hearts. So, go after what people feel. Go after the language of morality. Socialism is not a good idea that went wrong, and whenever you hear Republicans or conservatives say this, it's because they have the IQ of a kumquat. Socialism was a horribly <laughs> evil idea that went completely right. It went exactly as they thought it was going to go. This was the design from the start. Socialism is a fundamentally immoral, evil, unfair, discriminatory, and, and disgusting system that violates off the bat three of the Ten Commandments. Right? You don't steal. God not government, and you shouldn't be jealous of your neighbor's ass, right? That's the, the, the that's the, in, in the actual language, correct? Yes. Not the Bill Clinton language. So, these are, these are the terms that we should be speaking. These are the terms that hit young people. 
because young people don't, nobody has the time to read all of the, the entire editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. Nobody does. Everybody's attention span is five seconds long. So if you can't make people feel good about being conservative, make them feel really, really bad about, feel, about being leftist. You know why? They deserve to feel bad about being leftist. They're siding with an evil ideology. Hi. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming here. Um, I... Uh, disagree with a lot of what you said tonight. Good. Um, <laughs> That's yeah, nice I, fun. I don't believe that uh, being transgender means that you have some sort of mental illness. Okay. Um, and I think that the majority of the like, psychological, um, like national uh, associations would agree with that. Um, and I think that there's a lot of evidence that um, institutional racism exists and uh, that it manifests itself in very real and negative and harmful ways. Okay. Um, but I don't feel any violence or animosity towards you. And I would say that most of the people that I know um, might wish that you uh, wouldn't Didn't spread exist. ideas. <laughs> they might wish that you wouldn't spread ideas that they find um, harmful and negative, mm -hmm. but um, they don't feel any direct ill will towards you in any well, violent way that they would carry right out. Um, so I guess. What I've been feeling throughout this talk is kind of this vast mischaracterization of the left as some sort of homogenous, violent, um, oppressive body. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, mo the majority of the people that I know and the majority of the interactions that I've had with communities on a larger scale mm -hmm. um, have not matched that representation. So okay. I was wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about sure. the so non violence. So there are two aspects to the non violence. Okay? And I think one you will agree with and one you will disagree with. So the one that you will agree with is the one that you've already agreed with, which is that you don't get to hurt people just because of what they're saying, right? This we, we all agree with. This is also the distinction. There's a reason I use the word leftist and not the word liberal. I think there is a distinction between people who are liberals and people who are leftists. I think that people who are liberals may disagree with me on politics, but they don't feel that they get to use force to shut people down. Leftists don't feel the same way. So that is an actual distinction. Uh, there is, now, here's the part where we'll, where we'll disagree. I think that if you are seeking to use the government to cram down your particular vision of society on individuals in violation of their freedom, that this is an aspect of totalitarianism. You, whether, whether you want to shut me down or whether, or whether you want to, let's, say, let's pretend for a second that I were a baker. And let's say that I'm a religious baker. I'm a religious person, so let's say I were a baker. And let's say that I don't want to participate in a same-sex wedding because I feel that that's sinful in my own religious belief. My belief is that's none of your business. The belief of most people on the left is that there should be legislation that forces me to cater to that same-sex wedding. My polls, this is true. So, now we're getting into dicey territory because now this does implicate violence. It, it implicates governmentally used violence. So, you know, you can be, I'm, I'm happy you're libertarian essentially with regard to my speech. But when it comes to my behavior, you're significantly less libertarian than I am. You can do what you want, I don't care. But people on the left deeply care what I do in my personal life that they have, they have no right to my labor and they have no right to my services. So this is where the, the pedal hits the metal in terms of American politics, and this is where the pedal will hit the metal when the government starts getting more and more deeply involved. As far as the institutional racism, all I would ask you to consider, you can believe what you want, but I would ask you to consider this. Shouting institutional racism does not actually combat racism. You have to find individual instances and you have to show me who the racists are so that we can fight them together. I hate racism. I think it's evil. But if you're just going to say institutional racism every time something bad happens, there's no way to fight it. I need a policy that you're proposing, or I need a person who's actually racist so that we can fight it together, or we can determine whether the policy is good. What I find, what I find really problematic is, is the, the virtue signaling that I see by so many people on the other side, which is, I don't have to give you the racist, I don't have to tell you who he is or what measures I'm proposing, I just say institutional racism, everybody cheers for me because that's an approved point of view, and now we move on with our lives. You haven't helped anybody, you've just made yourself feel better. It's really, yeah, yeah have her respond, please. Um, well, I think that uh, just um, institutional racism in and of itself, uh, first of all, I would say that the majority of the people that um, do bring up institutional racism do also have solutions as to how to combat it. Um, but Which I think that it, involve encroaching on other people's liberty. But yes. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I would, I would just say that um, there is kind of you, again. I feel like you're painting um, a, a wide and diverse group of people with the same brush and saying that uh, if you can't point to um, a policy or if you can't point to a person then uh, you know, you're just wasting everyone's time. And I think that a lot of people are trying to point to policies. And while 
Oh, I, I think, I think right. that the idea of pointing to a racist person mm -hmm. is fundamentally in contrast with the idea of institutional racism because institutional racism grapples with um, implicit bias in the society as a whole, or not like, yeah, not like it goes to right, unless, unless, in you're, unless you're connecting that to a policy to cop out. Because now we're ghost hunting again. If you, well, if you just said to me, we have a problem in American society, income inequality, right, is a problem in American society. If you just gave me any problem, and I said, well, that's, this, that's the Bilderberg's fault. Right, that's the fault of the Bilderbergs, right? It's just it's a conspiracy, it's the fault of the Bilderbergs, right? This is this there's all these conspiracy theories about the Bilderberg group. So let's say that it's the Bilderberg's fault, or it's the protocols with the elders of Zion. It's whatever it is, there's some conspiracy out there. You would say to me that's not useful because how are we, what what are you even talking about? When you say institutional racism, it's too broad. You at least have to name me the institution. Which one is the racist one? Which institution is racist? Tell me which, like, so we can fight it, seriously, so we can fight it together. Just shouting slogans like institutional racism is not, it's not effective. Shouting white privilege is not effective. I want to be on your side. I do. I want to fight racists. I think race, again, I think racism is, I think racist, racist behavior is evil. I want to fight it with you, but I can't fight it if you're not, if you're not showing me what it is. And we have to decide together if the policies you're proposing will alleviate racism or exacerbate racism. And it turns out, I think, that a lot of the policies proposed by the left, I think institutional racism is a way, is, is usually a lever for proposing a policy that is actually unpalatable to freedom and then, in, and, then, and then castigating people on the other side of that policy as being in league with the institutional racism. The policies are good or bad without regard to words like institutional racism, is what I'm saying. I wish, I, honestly, I'd love to sit down and talk with you for an hour about it because it's because it's a worthwhile conversation and I think we could actually get somewhere with it. But I think that slogans generally tend not to be particularly effective in getting us to solutions. Okay. Thank you. Uh